Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for our fourth in a series of career interest panels. Uh, today, we will be talking about medicine, and we have with us uh, three physicians, Dr. Luella Amos, who, grew, uh, who graduated from USM in 1995. She is an associate professor of pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin, Division of Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine. She is also chief of Department of Medicine at Children's Wisconsin. We have also Dr. Ryan Kana, who is a graduate of USM from 2008. He uh, is also a graduate of Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and is currently a senior neurosurgery resident at Rush University Medical uh, Center, a hospital system in Chicago, Illinois. Next July, he'll be starting as a spinal oncology fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering, a cancer center based in New York City. And finally, we have with us USM parent, Dr. Joe Coley, a practicing orthopedic surgeon and who is also the founder and president of Empiric, a private healthcare technology company uh, focused on measuring and improving value in healthcare. He is also currently a fellowship trained orthopedic sports medicine specialist and is practicing at Aurora Healthcare. Today, our panelists will be talking about how they got to where they currently are, uh, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis now that they are there, where they think the industry is going, and tips for those who hope to follow in their footsteps. And so with that in mind, um, I will begin with Dr. Kana and have you uh, address some of those points. And then if you can turn it over to Dr. Coley and we will finish up with Dr. Amos. Sound good? All right, Dr. Kana, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so where would we like to start, Mrs. Arwell? Okay, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now and uh, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis now that you are there. And also students, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A session. We will answer as many as we can get to. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was a USM graduate of 2008. Um, started actually in eighth grade um, and finished upper school. Uh, and afterwards, I actually was a, applied to colleges kind of all across the country, um, but was ended up uh, actually choosing to enroll in a combined med school program at Northwestern, uh, which I believe actually no longer exists. Um, but at that time, it was a seven year med program um, and uh, ended up doing biomedical engineering during my undergrad years. Uh, then went, proceeded to go to medical school um, where I actually took a year off uh, because I wasn't sure after kind of, kind of going through it really quickly, I wasn't sure if I actually really wanted to be a physician. Uh, so took a year off, um, did some research, worked at a consulting company called McKinsey for a little bit. Um, then ended up deciding that I did want to do practice medicine. Um, so reapplied, uh, or sorry, replied into residencies um, into the current specialty I'm currently pursuing, which is neurosurgery. Um, I stayed in Chicago at a health system called uh, Rush University Medical Center, um, where I'm a fifth year resident. And as Mrs. Arwell uh, just said, I'm planning on doing a fellowship. Um, and then eventually going to um, practice in probably the field of uh, spinal oncology. So treating tumors of and around the spine. Um, in terms of day-to-day, -day, uh, it's a little bit different for me than our other panelists because I'm still in training. So uh, for neurosurgery residency, um, it's technically the longest residency. Uh, it's seven years of length, which um, definitely is something to consider when you're uh, when you're thinking about a career in medicine. Uh, I'm sure the other panelists definitely have uh, thoughts about that. But for any career in medicine, we have uh, four years of undergrad usually, uh, four years of medical school, and that's assuming that you're not taking time off, which it sounds like it's in vogue now to at least take a little bit of time off to uh, do a research year or a gap year um, and figure out if you actually really want to do medicine. So talking about a minimum of eight years off the bat, and then uh, residency ranges from three years as the minimum for a internal medicine or pediatric, uh, and that's considering no fellowship. And then fellowships after that range somewhere between um, one to um, one to three to four years. And training after medical school can be up to 10, 11 years in certain cases, um, if you're into these really super specialized surgical um, subspecialties. Uh, in terms of day to day, um, as a surgery resident, it's, um, it depends on what year you are. Earlier on training, it's a lot of taking care of patients in and outside of the operating room, uh, mostly before and after. Uh, as you get older into the stage where I'm at, um, it's a lot of being into the uh, operating room. Uh, I 
I was just kind of looking at, um, and for me, since I'm a neurosurgery resident, it means operating on uh, the brain and spine mostly. Uh, we do do cases on the other um, areas of the body that have areas of nervous tissue. Um, I was actually looking to see if I just had any videos for uh, the students on the call um, to see if there's kind of something. So I was just looking and there's one case I did last week and I'll share my screen. If you're kind of squeamish, you might want to look away, but um, just an example of kind of what I do daily on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, last week we had a patient that uh, had a condition called a spinal dural AV fistula, which is basically a situation where your vasculature or the blood vessels of your body, um, especially around your spine, can cause problems with uh, urinating and problems with walking and, and problems with balance. Um, so we ended up taking the bone off uh, the spine that's covering the spinal cord and then opening up the spinal cord. Let me just show that for you guys. I think you guys can see it. Uh, Mrs. Arvo, can you guys see that? So yeah, so looking at my screen, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but this is, um, the spinal cord is, the, the black strings are holding up what we call the dura or the covering of the spinal cord. And then we open that up and you can see there is um, all those things that kind of look like licorice um, or Twizzlers are the blood vessel. And um, it's, a, it's a, about a two or three hour surgery, but you ended up opening the, the covering of the spinal cord. And then uh, you look to see where there's like an abnormal connection. So you uh, end up severing that connection with either a clip or, um, or taking some kind of cautery device to end that. Uh, that's just one example of a case I do, but we obviously do um, cases of brain tumors, brain aneurysms, uh, and then a lot of people have spinal cord issues from like arthritis in the spine. So that's kind of my day-to-day -day, um, life as a resident. It's a lot of early mornings and late nights, but um, you kind of sign up for that when you start residency. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the, what you found to be the most critical classes uh, that you took at, your, at the undergraduate level? Um, and now that you've been as far, as far into this process as you have, you thought about stepping away from it and then step back to it. What are the essential traits that somebody who is going to stick with medicine really needs to have? Uh, I think you definitely need to have the commitment to, to going through the long project, the long arduous process, which I talked about. Um, I'm still 30 and I still have two or three years left of training. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, for you guys, it's probably think that high school has been long enough. You're waiting to get to college. And since college, I'm already, already still been some form of school for another 12 years. Um, so I think that's something that it's really critical. Uh, I think if you're, if you, if you don't like school or if you don't fa can't fathom being in school that long, medicine's definitely not the career for you. Um, there's other things to do. Um, and kind of uh, perspective, I think you also have to like to, to, to and want to have to treat patients. Uh, I know um, I have a lot of friends who started medical school and left um, for a variety of reasons, but I think the fundamental reason that everybody ended up leaving that did um, is that they liked doing other things more. Um, you have to really want to treat patients because some people go into it because they think it's prestigious or they think there's money and there's better ways of doing both of those things um, that are less that are less rigorous and less time commitment. And you definitely are signing up for, at least in surgery, um, you definitely are signing up for some sort of a lifestyle where you are um, kind of committed to it. Um, I was on call this entire weekend. You're getting called in um, in the middle of the night on like Saturday night, an emergency case where I had to, had to go in. Um, and it was really early on and you guys are still in high school, but Later in, uh, later in your life, uh, you have to have that commitment that you're willing to come in in the middle of the night um, to treat pathologies or treat patients uh, when they need you. Thank you, Dr. Khanna. Uh, Dr. Kohli, can you tell us a little bit about your um, career path? Uh, sure, yeah, I didn't take a, a straight path either. Um, I went to high school in Glenview, just outside of Chicago. Um, I went to undergrad at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I got a degree from Wharton in finance. Um, I took a year off in college to start a nonprofit group. Um, went back, finished uh, college, um, worked for a software company for a year, um, decided I didn't want to do business or finance. And then I did a post back where you go to, uh, I went to Bryn Mawr, but there's a number of schools that do this. 
and I took the uh, organic, the chemistry, the physics. Um, so I started med school at Northwestern as well when I was 25. So I was, I was an old man by that time. Um, did the four years of med school, did five years of orthopedic residency, did a year of fellowship in Boston, uh, moved out to um, here at Wisconsin. Um, I have three kids that go to USM. Um, started practicing, I'm an orthopedic surgeon now. Um, and uh, um, this is where I'm at now. We started a, a company um, back in 2011, 2012. Uh, it's evolved, so we've had a number of raises. We're doing well. We got about 25 employees. We basically do artificial intelligence, trying to analyze echoes and um, progress notes and surgical notes to determine who would be an optimal person to have. Uh, we started with TAVERS, which is a type of aortic valve replacement, but we're moving into the entire cardiac field. So definitely not a traditional path. Um, my main job is still orthopedics. I do mostly shoulders. Uh, I'm in clinic Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday and operate on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, like Ryan was saying, residency and fellowship in medical school to a certain degree is especially if you do neurosurgery, do ortho, or if you do urology, those are things I have experience with with the surgical subspecialties. That is a long road and that is difficult and you gotta have resilience to do that. I'm sure it's the same way with pediatrics and internal medicine. I just don't have as much experience with that. Um, but once you get through it, um, you know, as the oldest person on the panel, uh, once you get through it and it's all behind you, it's fantastic. Um, it's great. If you, if you think about surgery, working with your hands and fixing people, it's a blast. And then also there's so much room for improvement in medicine. You can use artificial intelligence, natural language processing. There's things that you can use in technology that other fields use that medicine doesn't. So if you like medicine and you have an innovative mind, I think it's a great field to go into. Um, next week, we're going to experiment with a company that uh, does shoulder implants. We're going to experiment with, uh, augmented reality. So in order to do a shoulder replacement, sometimes we use these jigs um, to figure out the best place to put the replacement. But now we're going to put these goggles on and see if we can do it without that and just use um, these VR glasses to do it. So I took a long road. There's tons of opportunity. I think I would recommend if you're going to go into medicine, I think orthopedic surgery, if you have that type of personality that likes to work with your hands and um, likes that kind of um, interaction um, where you have a problem, you solve it. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great field. All right. Um, uh, Dr. Amos, before we get to you, if I can just ask one quick follow-up question um, to both Dr. Khanna and Dr. Coley. So Dr. Khanna, you talked about um, spending a year working at McKinsey. Um, Dr. Coley, you've had a number of outside experiences, degree in finance and so on. It, it's, um, it, it's you're working your own not or creating your own nonprofit. Could you tell us a little bit about how have these outside experiences? How do they inform your practice of medicine, and do you see them as particularly valuable in that? Um, for sure. I mean, you get so much more perspective on what you want to do. Um, I went to Northwestern. There were a lot of people that went through the seven-year program. Um, it's a, it's a tough road. It seems like the seven year program is a tough road. If you get some outside experiences, um, uh, it just gives you more perspective on what you want to do. And it really helps you because you start to, whenever you choose a path, you, you, you second guess your decisions. If you've at least done something, you have some perspective that maybe the decision that you're making to go into medicine, despite how hard it is, is the right decision. So I think, you know, Working for McKinsey is spectacular, you know, for a year, doing any kind of outside experience outside of medicine, traveling, uh, any kind of uh, skip year or whatever you guys call it now is a great, great idea. Yeah, yeah I definitely uh, echo those uh, sentiments by Dr. Coley. Uh, for me, I ended up um, interested not just in practicing clinical medicine like Dr. Coley, I'm interested in um, especially like you mentioned, there's a lot of room for improvement in medical devices. Um, I'm interested in uh, device development. Um, there's a lot of room for that in orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery. And uh, one of the reasons I ended up doing biomedical engineering as an undergrad 
Um, and actually, I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, in neurosurgery, there's it's a long residency and they give us some time for elective time. So I ended up actually, during my elective year, I ended up going back to Northwestern um, and did an MBA at their business school at Kellogg. Um, and just like he mentioned, it gives you a lot of perspective. Um, it, when you do other things, it makes you realize what you like to do. Um, and, uh, and there was no further, no better example than when I went to back to business school uh, last year and I was taking a lot of healthcare classes and I realized that I liked the business side of healthcare, but more, si more so the healthcare side of it than the business side of it. So um, it, gives, it definitely gives you a good perspective. And I think one thing that, um, one common trait I think that we both are both alluding to is that in medicine, there's a lot of room to do a lot. So if you just wanna practice on clinical medicine and do that, you can do that all day. Versus if you wanna do a, have a practice later in your life where you're doing 50% clinical care, 50% advising and designing medical devices, that's also something that you can do. Or if you wanna go into administration or if you, uh, I've met a school classmates who did research, um, did MD, PhDs, and some of them see patients once a week and are just doing, writing grants and are in a basic science lab all day. So there's a lot of opportunity to do different things uh, once you go to med school and once you graduate and uh, finish with your training. Dr. Amos, could you tell us a little bit about your path and where you see the future of medicine going? Sure, um, so um, I graduated in 1995 from USM and I went to the University of Madison for undergrad and I stuck around for med school. Um, I kind of went the non-direct, um, not direct, but like, you know, I didn't do a you know, med scholars program or anything that was direct, um, kind of went the traditional way, I guess. And then I went all the way back to Milwaukee for a residency in pediatrics. I stayed there for Pete's pulmonary fellowship, which is three more years. And I did one year of sleep fellowship here in Milwaukee at medical college. So essentially four years of undergrad, four years of med school, three years of pediatric residency, three years of pulmonary fellowship, and then one year of sleep fellowship. Okay, so let's kind of rewind. What kind of got me into medicine was I realized in high school that I, I really liked algorithms. I liked problem solving and I liked pattern recognition. I did not like English. <laughs> um, I wasn't very good at it, at least. You know, I kind of, if you gave me a, you know, how do you create a poem? What kind of poem do you want? I will do it. You know, I will put the number of words in each line that you want, and it will sound good compared to what you gave an example of. Like, I could follow a pattern, and I could put the number of words you wanted on each line, but then if you wanted me to create something amazing, it was just not going to be me. So I realized that. Um, and so... Um, so that's kind of how I, I sort of thought about science and medicine. Um, I took AP exams and everything I could uh, pretty much to try to get a head start in college. I was always about getting ahead. And the first day I started in, in college, I counted towards my, my major. My major was Spanish. So that was interesting too. Um, but I really was more thinking I kind of want to use something in medicine and Spanish obviously is very, very useful. And it did help me kind of stick out a little bit compared to my science major colleagues who were applying to medical school. Um, I still had to do well in the science classes, but, um, but the Spanish kind of stuck out just like there was an English major. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, or philosophy too, you know, but as long as you get all those prereqs in, you could probably, um, do well in, or in terms of getting into med school. Um, some other things were, you know, the AP Chem, AP Physics, all that was very useful. In fact, I found it, the classes I was taking in college were almost like review from the AP Chemistry classes. So that was very nice and, and easier. So the nice thing about college was that it wasn't eight hours of classes every day. It was like you could schedule things later on. You could sleep in. I could take 12 credits this year, this semester. I could take 15 the next. You know, um, I just felt like I had more control um, in college because I got that head start in high school. The one thing I don't recommend, though, is not taking physics because I actually tested out of physics, and then I had to take the MCAS, and I'm like, well, what's physics? So. Uh, you, you really should know your physics for the MCAT. Um, okay, so that's kind of how I got into medicine. Now, how did I decide on pediatrics? Um, 
to be honest, I was thinking ob Gynes because they developed this great relationship with the women, you know, late nights, struggling to get the video. Um, and then I kind of developed this pit in my stomach. I got like, oh, I don't think this is really right. But I think I like that thing in the warmer. So <laughs> it was pediatrics. Um, I don't recommend saying that on your interviews, though. <laughs> um, but that was kind of how it, it came to me. It, things sometimes just come to you and you just, it falls into your lap, to be honest. So I'm in pediatric residency, and I realize there's a whole lot to learn. So I'm like, I need to specialize. I don't want to make any mistakes when it comes to these little things. Like, I don't want to miss anything. So I decided I needed to specialize. And so I got to know some of the pulmonologists and nephrologists. They all seem to have reasonable lifestyles, and I like the physiology. Pete's palm. Sleep just kind of came along because my mentor is like, oh, I like sleep. And I'm like, so do I. <laughs> It was really very an interesting path for me. But um, long story short, a lot of things have just kind of unraveled as I've come to where I am today. And so what do I do on a daily basis? I'm in clinic. I go to the OR randomly sometimes, although I get a bit in my stomach because that's really not my comfort zone. But I go to the OR to do bronchoscopies. I'm inpatient medicine. I see our sick patients in the hospital, our sick patients with lung disease, our sick patients who are vaping. Um, and then um, outpatient, and I read sleep studies as well with my sleep medicine background. So I have a huge variety of things that I do on a daily basis. And then when I get home, I have my son and I have tennis. So I play tennis almost every day and then I play with my son if he will let me play tennis with him. Um, tips. Okay, so one thing about med school is there's a lot of information. No matter what you end up going into, there's a lot of information. And so cramming is really not the best thing to do. People do it, some people are really good at it, but if you know that this is stuff you're gonna use down the line, the way to really learn it is little by little each day. So really kind of that long-term studying a little bit each day, that will stick in your memory. You can definitely cram the night before an exam, but um, I can guarantee you half that stuff won't stick. And so if you're trying to build knowledge on knowledge on knowledge, you really need to do incremental, you know, cumulative accumulation of knowledge. Because everything you do now, especially in med school, will be needed eventually, you know, down the line. And you can't get rid of some of that knowledge. You have to sort of keep as much of it as you can. Um, and that's kind of where I think I have enough. I said enough. <laughs> Dr. Amos. All right. One question did come in um, that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. How do you cope with either the loss of a patient or a medical error? It's a, oops. it's a, it's incredibly unpleasant. Um, it's a, there's no, there's no easy way to do that. So, I mean, and uh, mistakes happen and, and um, you have to, we're taught, you have to acknowledge the mistake. You have to address it head on and you have to, um, be open and honest and you spend this entire time uh, with this job where you want to really help people and then if something goes wrong or something goes south you start to doubt yourself doubt your skills doubt any number of different things and then you just kind of you know you have to figure out to get a way to get through it and that's by talking to other colleagues and by being open and honest and just going forward. And if you talk to a lot of us, you know, especially if you're going through residency, you think that it's just a grind and terrible. And it is to a certain extent, it's very tough. And I didn't mean to be that frank about how bad residency is, but residency can be tough. Um, but you need that kind of resilience. It teaches you to be tough. And part of that toughness is just acknowledging when things go south and doing your best to address it. I, um, I also have some suggestions for this question. Um, establishing a really good relationship with the patient and with the patient's family when you're in pediatrics or even in adult medicine will be protective of you. Um, very rarely have, 
has people who have a really good relationship with a family gotten male practice suits against them. Um, there are certain specialties that just might have a little bit more complaints, like when it's kind of a one-stop shop, like the ER, you know, I'm, I'm kind of involved with patient complaints and compliments and um, complaints definitely come when you're, you know, you're only seeing them once and they didn't really like what they thought, you know, what happened. They didn't get to see the specialist that they wanted to see or um, personality conflicts and you know, just that one five hour visit in the ER. Um, so, but it's very rare to have that kind of complaint when you have a chronic relationship, you know, with chronic um, patients. So um, I think really kind of having a good open and respectful relationship with a patient will be protective. It won't always protect you, but I think it's always a good idea and, and, and will be usually to your advantage. The, clearly the mental health issues um, around medicine, it's, it's important to take care of yourself as well as your patients so that you can encounter those difficult days and build the resilience. Um, uh, what it related then, another question that came in is, in is I'm curious to know, um, even though a medical career is difficult, would you say that you have a balanced life? Uh, uh, in med, med school, uh, yes. Residency, no. Um, not even close. And then when you're done, you have a balanced life. I think, yeah. I think I'm awfully on a different perspective since my life is definitely not balanced right now. Um, but uh, I think it's one of those things you choose what you want afterwards. Uh, some people I know are workaholics and want to work all the time, and that's what they prefer of the preferences. Um, but if you want a balanced life, I think you make sacrifices and uh, whether it's money or whether it's number of cases done or whatever, you can decide what your priorities are and live whatever life you want to. You have a lot more control of it once you're done with residency, as far as I can understand. I have to agree. Um, being a woman in medicine, I, I feel like I have a lot to prove. And, you know, um, and so I want to accept every single accolade and, and, and promotion, but I can't always do that um, um, just because I do have a family, I do have a son I want to be present for, and I do have my extracurricular tennis therapy um, that I have to make time for. Um, and I've, I've realized what's important, uh, and it's important to, re to make sure that you you keep you keep that priority uh, that list of priorities straight um, for marriage for uh, your mental health for your physical health um, but also it's very hard to not want to accelerate and to promote yourself because you spent eight plus nine ten twelve years in, in training in and debt I think that's another question how much debt are we in. Um, to get to where we are. So um, absolutely, it's possible, but you have to make sure you make your priorities known and, and, and straight. All right, thank you. Another question that uh, came in, and Dr. Khan, I know that you have a busy schedule today and may need to duck out early. So I'm just going to say thank you very much now in case you do. Um, we appreciate your, your insights and yeah. And during your unbalanced residency years, thank you for making extra time for us today. Yeah, I appreciate Very it. Glad. You can get um, my contact information from Mrs. Arwell if you guys have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and then Dr. Coley, Dr. Amos, and as long as you can be here, Dr. Kana, um, uh, one question, would you say most med schools require very high grades or honor roll reputations while in high school and will taking uh, more elective honors science classes improve chances of getting into a good school and give you a head start for the schooling itself. So basically, what constitutes a good school if, you're, if med school is your ultimate goal? And what courses should you be focusing on? Or is it the learning traits behind them? Uh, I, I can. Uh, so you have to get um, great grades. Uh, you have to go to a reasonable school. If you go to a great school and get lousy grades, you're not gonna get into med school either. 
So you just gotta, there's, there's no way around it. You have to um, get almost all A's, do really well in standard testing. Um, they have certain hoops that you have to jump through. And, and I'm, I'm distant. So I, I went to med school and I graduated in 2001. So um, that was a while ago, but uh, I'm not sure it's changed all that much, but you have to do, you have to do really well. And it doesn't matter. I don't, I, so I majored in economics. I didn't take a real science course until after college. So you don't have to major in science. You just have to do well at whatever you do. I completely agree. Um, my brother went to Northwestern University um, and wanted to go into medicine, but it was really hard in terms of the classes he took and his GPA. So he actually told me, because he was six years older than me, he's like, go to Madison, get a 4.0, and then apply to med school. I'm like, okay, like that's really easy. I didn't get a 4.0, but um, did not. <laughs> but I worked very hard and I, I was able to get mostly A's, but I, I agree. You are a little bit more of a statistic um, when you're kind of in the med school application route. You're, there are a lot of med students or prospective med students um, so you kind of have to stick out, which I would kind of use Spanish to, to stick out a little bit. All right. From the counseling point of view, what I can uh, tell you is that a good school, what that means is not the, necessarily the prestige outside um, uh, or on the rankings lists. A good school is one where you can really excel, when you can capitalize on the opportunities that are before you really dive into the classes, make good connections with your professors, and have outside opportunities that can help enhance your knowledge overall. So when you're thinking good school, that's a good school for you, and it's gonna be a different answer for absolutely everybody. But being able to be successful at those standard prerequisites, that matters a lot. So go where you learn best, that's the best school. And then um, finally, kids are going to be uh, having to drop off to go to class. I know that, but there is one last question and this one um, that will be a little bit simpler to answer. Um, uh, uh, how expensive is med school and how do you manage the debt that's associated with that? Um, it's expensive and uh, uh, you get loans or do what you have to do to pay for it and you just work and pay it off. Um, I didn't, did you get, I didn't get a scholarship or anything. I don't know how many scholarships they offer for medicine. Um, but um, yeah, I, I paid off my loans and, but it just takes a little bit of time. Yeah, it's expensive. Um, there are some people still my age working on paying loans and I'm 44 um, paying off loans. So it could be a long haul if you're still, you know, if you didn't pay off early on. Um, uh, I don't know what it is nowadays, but back when I was in my school, I don't know, in 2003, um, I think the debt could have been well over 200 grand. Yeah, still very much uh, that part of it. And so that's a, that's a good question. And as you're planning for the long term and thinking about undergraduate degree, know that that undergraduate degree is, is going to be part of that. So um, if affordability, if you know that med school is definitely in your future, um, contemplating affordability all the way through is super important. So are there any last tips that um, you would like to offer or any suggestions for, for the students who want to follow in your footsteps? Um, if you have an opportunity, just get, try to, uh, and if this is something you want to do, um, you can, uh, find someone to shadow, um, in the hospital, see what you think about it. And, uh, you can always come, uh, I'll give my info to Susan and you can always just, uh, uh, come to the OR if you want to see something, especially over the summer. But yeah, just try to, if you're going to be good at, if you're going to do this, you got to kind of, uh, uh fall in love with it, I guess. You have to kind of be really, really into it because it is uh, it is a long road. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said today. Um, it's, uh, you have to sort of like people. And I, I know that sounds weird, but you do. Um, 
my husband was um, he's a pathologist and he was going to do surgery he was going to do internal medicine he was going to be a teacher too but then he realized you know I kind of don't like when they complain <laughs> so he's a pathologist I mean okay but he still has to deal with people but um but I think, you know, there, you just kind of have to realize your own personality. What do you like to do? What do you see yourself enjoying? And then, and then kind of go from there to figure out if this is really for you. Um, I would have to say a lot of my adult colleagues, adult medicine colleagues, are so scared to rotate in pediatrics just because they're like, they're really scared of the kids and they're really scared of the parents just because, you know, it's been a while since they've seen children, especially since med school. So anyways... It is, you know, it's the personality. You kind of have to also keep that in mind. I am not a surgeon, and I never will be, never was, never will be. Um, and I still get kind of stomach aches in the OR. So I know that. Um, but um, but I think that's a, that's a good start, just kind of realizing what what your personality is like. And um, I think it'll be successful. All right, so from the, the counseling perspective, so look within and know yourself and then make good decisions um, that are great words of wisdom to end on. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Cole and Dr. Amos for making the time today. We are so grateful for your expertise and insight to tell us about your life's journey. And uh, students, hope you found it helpful. Um, if you do have additional questions, please feel free to pass them on to me. And uh, on behalf of the Internship and Shadowing Committee, Thank you very, very much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.